Uh, good evening and welcome to the latest in our series of audience with webinars. I'm uh, extremely pleased to uh, have a popular face on the webinar tonight with us, uh, Will Evans, who uh, I think must have a very busy life as an understatement. Will, uh, firstly, most importantly, a father of four girls, Farmers Weekly columnist, director of the Oxford Farming Conference, co-founder and one of the managers of the eatfarmnow.com website and probably is uh, another great achievement is the host uh, of the weekly podcast rock and roll farming so uh, great to have you will um, and thank you for, for fitting us in um, so um, and just as, an, as uh, anyone that has any uh, any attendees that have any questions just pop them. You should have a questions box on the side of the webinar, which comes up on my screen. So we'll uh, we'll do our best uh, to answer those. So so thank you, Will. Um, possibly thank the you, first man. thing is um, before we get into all those roles you have, it, uh, I'm sure I and, and many others would be interested just to get a bit of background on the family farm, how you've ended up where you are, what it's about, etc. Farmers are no, farmers are nosy, aren't we? We all like to know about <laughs> other people's farms. <laughs> Yeah, so we're um, in northeast Wales, about um, five miles from Wrexham, and I'm right on the border with England. Um, my uh, family have been here um, since 1950. My grandfather moved here in 1950. Um, about 500 acres, uh, mixed farm, um, beef and arable, do a bit of contracting as well. Um, uh, tenanted, rented farm. Um, the well, two farms really, uh, and the River Dee runs right the way through the middle of the two. We're sort of right in the bottom of a river valley, we're only 60 feet above sea level, so um, flooding is a is an issue uh, more and more. Um, yeah. uh, and I I live in in the house here uh, on in in the farm um, with my wife and four young daughters, and uh, I farm in partnership um, with my parents. So yeah, I think, I think that's it. Oh, that's really interesting and and, and very typical uh, of a lot of farm setups around the country, isn't it? Um, yeah. It can be clearly seen from those of us that know you and follow you on social media and Farmers Weekly. You have a have a, a massive passion for agriculture and and the mm -hmm. rural community. Uh, and as I said early uh, when I introduced you, you, you have many roles. Um, what what sort of motivates you as as will to to do all those to fit them all in and the drive um it's a struggle to balance it all and i've had to get much better at organizing myself um i don't know whether my wife would agree but i do try but um um i suppose it's um you know i grew up in a, in a as you've just kind of said really very sort of typical farming family farming community um certainly growing up all i think every single branch of my family was in farming in some way or another um all my grandparents my grandparents were farmers my great great grandparents were farmers going going back um kind of like did the typical farmers um son thing and left school when i was 16 to come and work on the farm because i didn't like school and spent much my most of my time looking out the window at sort of passing tractors and things like that which i which i probably regret now but there you go um and then so yeah came home got went, got into young farmers and that's where I, that's where i met my wife in young farmers so just sort of absolutely entrenched in the farming community and and i suppose i i've always been um I guess quite a people person so I'm quite I'm always interested in people's stories you know how they've got to their farm you know I'm just not in a not in a nosy way I'm just sort of interested in sort of the history of farming and social history and, and the countryside and things anyway so I guess I I I'm always interested in the kind of human stories behind farming and food production and I because of that I I I suppose I've always thought that I've always been slightly frustrated that more people don't realize how, to my mind, like farming is just really cool. You know, there's some brilliant yeah. stories behind why people do what they do, you know, why they've chosen this this life less ordinary. So um, 
you know, I guess I guess that was why I started to um, to to try and sort of get involved in a few wider industry things was to try and give something back a bit and and hopefully help in a small way to tell the farming story. Um, so yeah, I you know I think I think it's just that I'm I'm so you know I I I bleed farming. It's who I am, and you know despite all those other things that I do, you know first and foremost I'm a farmer, and I and I well I certainly hope I always will be. So um you know that's why that's why I'm so passionate about it, I guess. Mm, that's 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 fantastic, and uh, and resonates, I'm sure, with many of the, the the viewers of the webinar and myself. You know, I've often, you know, yes, I'm an accountant, but I, I'm only uh, an accountant because I look after farmers and rural businesses, and that's you know, farming is it's it's an amazing industry to be involved in. Um, and I can openly say, if I was if I, if I had to be a, a city accountant that sat behind the desk and did with city business, I wouldn't be up back back on the farm. Um, but we had too many white woolly things when I was a kid making my decision. Uh, and I'm, and I'm obviously a cattleman, but uh, <laughs> so I suppose was that sort of where the idea for for the rock and roll farming podcast came from to to tell more stories? How did that originate? Yeah. Um, so I was looking for a, I'd, I'd sort of started accidentally found sort of farmers on social media i suppose and started sort of just it taking pictures and um sort of showing sort of daily stuff we did on the farm and then i was looking for sort of something i wanted to um, do something a bit more because i could see the kind of how, how i could see the potential in that i suppose to, to, to sort of tell the farming story and um i don't particularly like being in front of a, a camera and I didn't really want to sort of, because really I'm I'm quite shy, really, which is something probably people don't realise about me. But I, I'm quite shy, really. I'm not, I'm not sort of someone who kind of walks into a room and kind of, you know, here I am type yeah, of thing. Yeah. That's not me at all. So I thought, well, if I if I had been an early listener to podcasts, I mean, not really, um, not farming ones, but just general interest in sport and history and things. So then I um. I thought, wouldn't it wouldn't it be great if there was a farming podcast here in the UK and and no one else is doing one? And I was a bit sort of frustrated at the time I, that sort of industry bodies and things hadn't you know weren't doing that. And I thought, well, if no one else is going to do one, then 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 I'll then I'll do it because um, you know I, you know it's no good being one of those people who just sort of you know complains that the NFU aren't doing it or AHDB aren't doing it. You know you. You know, you've got to you've got to make things happen yourself. I think, haven't you? So, yeah. I I just sort of googled how to make a podcast and and got on YouTube, and watched a few videos, and um, I got in touch with um, a load of farmers. And and once I explained to them what a podcast was, they were all sort yeah. of very, very, um, very. They all said yes, yes, we'd love to, you know, love to talk to you about the farm and things like that. And um, that, that was it really you chose a name and a theme tune and and just kind of went for it really and I didn't really expect it to go very far um and that just over four years ago now and I mean the biggest problem then was broadband and and kind of still is you know you try to interview people in remote rural areas and it's yeah. always a challenge but um um uh, yeah it, it's just kind of grown from there and then you know now from what was started in my spare bedroom now um i think it's had a, it's had well over a million downloads um wow in you know in over 100 different countries so you know this sort of idea that people aren't interested in farming is is wrong people are interested in human stories uh, behind food production and you know the more of us i think who are contributing to telling that story then hopefully the, the better the industry will be yeah that, that's it's, it's wonderful to hear and uh you know you a million downloads the the number of people and well you know stories you've had on there um is fantastic and i very much share your view and, and admire you for what you're doing because i think the biggest thing we've got to do as farmers is connect with the public who are our customers um okay. and, and you're doing great on that so so you've had you've had uh, i think it's in the region and i won't go something like about uh, you're up to about 180 guests or something on the rock and roll farming or more yeah, and, yeah. I, I, and uh, i suppose 
Is is there uh, any sort of memorable ones out of there that sort of stick in your head and think that one? I'll, ne I'll never forget that one. Or, <laughs> um, I mean, it's a bit cheesy, but I I, I genuinely love just you know I can't think of any that I haven't enjoyed. You know, and I do get. I mean, so you know, I sort of say I I, I started it to sort of tell the farming story and things, but I also selfishly I get loads out of it as well. You know, mm -hmm. I I love sort of speaking to these because you can learn something from every farmer um you know and it's not just farmers you know it's it's it sort of people connected to the industry as well but um as my wife will tell you you know usually when i've spoken to people i come sort of bouncing out the room afterwards and thought well, this you know they're doing this and you know and she has to sort of calm me down and um but yeah it's it's just i don't know i find it i find it very um a real privilege i suppose and you get sometimes you you know, you I'll, I'll speak to someone for sort of an hour and a half, and you have very sort of in-depth, quite intimate conversations, really, um, about things that they've really struggled with. And you know, we've talked about you know p people who've had real mental health challenges, and uh, or people who've, who've overcome very serious accidents and things like that. So, I think um, the fact that people uh, are willing to open up and and share those things um it's absolutely amazing and then you know, we always get such a reaction afterwards i mean you know i there, there are a couple i suppose i mean you know i, I spoke to doug avery who's a new zealand farmer yeah. and most people i guess would have heard of wrote a book called the resilient farmer and yeah um, when when doug came on the podcast you know I, I got sort of messages afterwards saying well i got a, i got a particularly memorable email from a, a farmer in australia who'd listened who who, who basically said, sent a very long email, basically said that, that hearing this podcast has saved my life wow. because I've, I've heard it and I've now reached out and I'm going to my doctor and I've, I've, you know, he was, he was on the floor and he heard it. And, you know, I mean, that's, that's totally down to Doug, but it's pretty cool to think, you know, you've, you've done, you know, you've helped something like that. So, um, you know, and then I, uh, there's another there's a lady who emails me sort of quite regularly she's currently having um uh quite serious cancer treatment some chemotherapy and it's really affecting her sleep you know she lies in bed at night she can't sleep and you know i think it's pretty aggressive cancer so she's clearly mm -hmm. got a lot on her mind and she emails me almost every week to say you know listen to the podcast help get me through the night and take my take my mind off some of my fears and things like that so you know the fact that you can you know with this sort of say podcast that i started in my spare room that you can you can just help people in a small way like that is is privilege i think and um yeah, it, it's things like that i suppose that keep keep me going with it that's so powerful um uh, and great respect for you doing it because you, you just uh, can't replicate that can't, those, those feelings and i think uh, you know, we have a, or some of it, well, it was an old, it was an old accountant who worked for this firm when I first started. He said, treat every day as a school day and yeah. you can always learn something. And I think uh, it's brilliant that you're, you know, you're encouraging and we all should do more of it, whatever. But farmers need to work together and talk and support each other, be it for mental well-being, be it for just general farming and dealing with the challenges. Because uh, there's always a danger that farmers end up competing against each other don't they you know i'll i'll do it cheaper than you or i'll i'll offer a higher rent than you and and in the end we've all got to run our own businesses but it you know it doesn't get the agricultural sector to where we want it to be really does it no it doesn't and i mean even you know just you look at everything that's happened over the 18 last 18 months with mm. with with covid and people being separated and you know not being able to see anybody and you know, it's been such a difficult time and you know i think sort of one thing i've sort of been thinking quite a bit about lately actually is um you know farmers are isolated at the best of times um yeah you know so, you know where we live sort of quite near the border with england as i mentioned you know we're quite we're not too far from a major town some quite big villages around but you know you don't have to go very far west of here to up into the into the mountains and those guys you know they only time they come really off their farms is to livestock market yes, um, yeah. and then they haven't even been able to see people there over the last 12 18 months which i think has been really really difficult for a lot of people oh, i know it has so um 
so yeah you know i think i think yes yeah, just the importance of bringing people together on yeah. community and kind of work together i think is hugely important yeah yeah that sort of brings us nicely on obviously um as well as well as the covid pandemic that has had its financial implications for some and it's it's uh, social and, and implications obviously we're going through a huge amount of change in uh you oh, we've got a huge amount of change potentially well, not potentially anymore is it we have a huge amount of change going to hit uk agriculture um yeah. what's your you know w- have you are you i'm sure you'll be starting to think what you're going to have to do or change on your farm what's your view on it f- from your own farm level and and what uk agriculture needs to do to react and i know that's a very big question and, and there's no one there's no there's no one answer but you know i'll be interested in and i'm sure the view the listeners will be interested in just your thoughts around what you might do yeah i think i think it's quite it's a difficult one, isn't it? Because I, I try and, um, you know, I do try and sort of take a step back and look at things objectively if I can. And I do think there will be opportunities moving forward. And I, you know, by by nature, I'm quite an optimistic person. So, you know, I do think, um, you know, I'm pretty confident that we will we will survive as an industry. You know, there's a lot of sort of doom and gloom about, and I do, and I get it. And I understand what certainly understand why people are worried and in this area you know i'm tenant farmer there's a lot of big um estates in this area um, a lot of tenant farmers small to medium sized farms mostly livestock and um, um, a lot of sheep farms um not far west of here so yeah. you know subsidy um and i understand why a lot of people uh will welcome the end of subsidies um I understand the reasons why people don't like it, um, but I think it is a worry. I mean, for a long time, that subsidy pretty much paid our rent. Um, yeah. Um, and you know, sometimes I see sort of very people who are quite blasé about it. Oh, you know, we'll we'll, you know, it's a good thing subsidies are going, and you know, it'll it'll sort out the wheat from the chaff, and you know, blah blah blah. And it's I think it's. I think it's a bit more complicated than that because you know it does potentially have a big impact on our communities um you know farmers in this area you know it's difficult to find the rent um yeah. tb is a huge issue uh, in this part of the world uh, having a massive yes. effect on dairy farmers and really stifling um you know, it costs a lot of money you know i don't think people quite government when i say people i mean government and policy yeah. makers realize how much time it takes up and how much how much it's so tiring as well you know, i spoke to a friend of mine the other day i went there to bale some hay and you know he he, he was saying you know that he, he's lost i think 60 cows in the last four months only fairly small dairy farm and he just yeah. got to the end of his tether with it he doesn't know what to do um so much so that he's worrying you know he's, he's wondering whether he's going to carry on so yeah yeah you know, whilst i am positive in some ways i do worry about sort of small to medium sized farms i worry about tenant farms you know we're in a agricultural holdings act tenancy here which means we're restricted to agricultural use only so i can't i can't go and put up a glamping pod or anything like that because i just can't and i know a lot of other tenant farmers are the same yeah um no i i hope i mean we're we're in wales so slightly different to the elm schemes that come in but you know I'm I'm hopeful they'll get it right, though I do worry a bit that the complexity of it is going to be extremely um, difficult for a lot of farmers. I, you know, from what I've seen, it does look as if it's going to be quite complex. But you know, I think some of the things are suggested with sort of incentives to 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 boost soil health and things like that are yeah. um, are a good thing. I you know, hopefully. Um, you know they can look to do something with hedges as well i think hedges are sort of quite neglected in um, farm environmental policies so you know things like that are quite easy wins i think so i mean i don't know i i i'm i'm pretty positive but i'm also i'd be lying if i said i wasn't concerned as well and you know on one hand i do think okay subsidies are going we'll get through it and we'll push on. But I mean, over sort of five, six years, as those subsidies go and it starts to bite a bit, um, 
you know, I do, I do worry about it. I'd be lying if I said I didn't, but um, yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, I, I remain hopeful. Yeah, and I absolutely respect and agree with that view, and that's probably where I'm at. I think you've got to try and remain optimistic um, uh, and positive and determined, um, but it's it's having a heavy dose of realism with it as well, isn't it? Um, it and is. I think, you know, there will be, um, for one man's challenge, it'll be somebody else's opportunity, um, no doubt, but um, I think you have to prepare for the prepare for it the best you can and keep your eyes wide open um yeah. and the only ones you know farms that worry me are, are those blase ones that are sort of like oh someone will come along and you know they'll not let us go at the wall and things and and they may well be right but I, i'm always a great believer in when you're advising clients and talking to farmers is well if you prepare for the worst yeah and it turns out better than that well you're in you, you you've hit the bonus um yeah. but if you if you just wing it could be problems but I, I, I and i was also going to ask you and it was interesting and i know you're just on the other side of the border but you, you keep an eye on things what's your sort of views on uh, on the proposed um farmer retirement scheme <laughs> yeah uh, <laughs> um <laughs> you know to be honest uh, and I, I don't i don't you know i'm reluctant to speak for for all farmers and you know yeah I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, yeah um you know but for sort of farms in this part of the world and i look around sort of this immediate area and sort of older farmers i know i think sometimes government i think they i think some of the language around that that kind of this will allow farmers to retire with dignity that really irritated me because I thought well, farms can retire with dignity anytime they like, you know, just, yes. it's, you know, that, although I accept that might be just someone who's thrown that phrase in without quite thinking, but I found personally found that a little bit insulting, but yeah. Um, I, you know, look, if it, if it frees up opportunities for young people, I'm all for it. I think, I think we desperately need sort of young people to come into farming and, and not only just come into farming, but have an opportunity to have a long-term opportunity, long-term tenancies, much longer than bloody five-year FBTs, which are yeah. no good to anyone, at least 10, 15 years, and give them an opportunity to really push on because there's loads of people who want to come in. And you know, if we can support them and they can we can find a way in, that's brilliant. I fear that what will happen is that, and again, I can only speak in this area. Oh, when farmers retire or give up a tenancy or sell up in this area, young people don't get the opportunity. It's just the big super dairy farms or the big farms who swallow it up. Uh, uh, and it just, you know, more and more farms get bigger and there's less and less yeah. numbers of farmers in the community. And I, I worry that, that, that this will just, that, that that will happen even more. And I see the idea behind it and I see what they're thinking. I'm not sure how that works in theory, how, how those young people take on someone who's already perhaps farming three or four or more farms uh, and can outbid them when it comes to the rent or, or, or the yeah. selling price. So yeah, yeah, I can see the idea behind it and maybe it'll be great, but I worry that it won't. Yeah, I, I know myself and my colleagues have sat and talked about it and I, I... Uh, we came out with the same view. I think I have nothing against the bigger outfits going for that land as it comes available, if that's their business strategy. But it, it definitely, I fear that it, it's of little use to young entrants trying to get into on the farming ladder, because um, mm. there will be there will be up against the established businesses, and and that's probably always gone on. But so it doesn't do what it says on the tin for me. No. Um, and I think it's you know we, there's a there's a farm uh, about 400 acre. Hill Farm come for let for you know further up in Northumberland, thankfully on a 15-year FBT. So I think that's quite forward thinking of the estate, and that's I think good. that you know. Um, but we, me and a colleague, sat, sat the other night and said, "Go on then. How much do you think it would take in working capital for that 400? Or how much to get it set up from a standing start?" Yeah. We came up with a figure over 300,000 just playing on mm. our pads, and you think, "Wow, that that you know, which bank or anything is going to back?" a new entrant tenant farmer to that tune 
um, mm -hmm. which then rules them out, doesn't it? Because yeah. they'll, you know, but that's where we're at, and we aren't going to change that. You talk about young people, and 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 succession's a key pet subject of mine. But um, you uh, you said you left, you got you got out of school as soon as you could because uh, you ought to be back to the family farm, and uh, and uh, um, so you, your own four girls. And there's some, you know, I think there's some extremely strong um, uh, female farmers nowadays. You know, we had last month's Annabelle Hamilton that was on last month was just brilliant. Um, so to where, what what happens when they come along? What your your oldest daughter comes along to dad and says, "I'm sick of school, dad. I'm going to finish as soon as I'm 16 and come home to work." How do you, what's your views on that one? <laughs> You know, I've never thought about that. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I, I mean, they, I think they're a bit better at school than I was. Um, my eldest is 10, she's 11 in September. Um, I don't, I'd be very surprised if my eldest wants to farm. Um, she, she doesn't show much, but but her the, the daughter number two, she might, she's quite interested. Um, yeah. I, you know, I'd, I'd be thrilled. I mean, if any if any of them want to farm, then, I'll, then I will obviously support them. Um, as much as I can, um, but you know, equally, if they don't want to, that's fine as well. I, I certainly wouldn't sort of push them into it. Um, but yeah, I'd, 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 I'd be absolutely thrilled. And if if one or more of them wanted to come onto the farm, then um, it, yeah, I'd, I'd be very proud. And, and obviously, I, w I would push on and try and find a place for all of them if I could God we've had to find a place for all of them all four yeah, of them yeah, yeah. but um you know if if if, if some of them want to farm then that would be then that would be great made me very happy yeah brilliant now another thing you I think you were involved with setting up and still heavily involved with is is the eat farm now sort of mm -hmm. website organization um tell us you know uh, tell us a bit more about it how you got involved what what its aims and what it's doing because i think the, yeah. it's, it's an interesting um, story yeah so um a few years i think it's probably about three years ago now i had this idea that so at that time there was a lot of uh farming podcasts a lot of farming videos a lot of blogs things like that and i and i was looking around and thinking well wouldn't it be great if 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 everybody kept on doing that but they were also sort of replicated all on one site wouldn't that sort of in the spirit of kind of bringing people together and trying to help build people's audiences and things like that wouldn't it be great so um got a few other people involved as a team of us and um we sort of set about building this site and that's that's what we tried to do really so you know any kind of anyone who's sort of putting out any farming content um we just sort of say well look if you want to we will put it on our site as well still your content you know it's 100% yours you own it but we will put it on the site and we will try and push it and promote it and you know give you a leg up and that's that's all we've tried to do with it really and um it's a fun thing to be involved with um when lockdown started we started a lockdown learning thing which was aimed at school children last year which was very okay. successful um and I, i'm really proud of that that was a, that was such mm. a brilliant thing and we had such great feedback from um, parents and children and teachers who were obviously struggling to juggle everything and uh, certainly when the lockdown first started so um yeah that, that was brilliant and yeah it's just something that's such a lot of fun to do and just sort of and just as i mentioned earlier really just getting the chance to sort of help people and give them a bit of you know, a bit of a lift you know i know from personal experience how time consuming and how um much effort it can be at times to sort of do this content and whether it be a podcast or a video and things and you know and you obviously trying to juggle family life and the farm and everything yeah. as well so you know if we can help in a small way then i think um you know that's a good thing and that's that's the whole sort of spirit of why we started it and why we why we keep trying to do it really so um yeah it's 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 a lot of fun to be involved with and they're a mm. brilliant, brilliant team behind it uh, excellent good and i would encourage anyone watching or listening to the webinar to go and have a look at the eat farm now uh dot com website because it, it is interesting um yeah loads of great now, content you you and i do um we're both fairly active on twitter and things uh and it's it has the good the bad the 
and the, and the not so not so good. But yeah. actually, you and I, there was a quick when we've been putting some of the the media out about this uh, webinar tonight and putting you on the other side of the other side of the microphone as it is. Um, some of the you and I both uh, see on Twitter is is Nigel Pugh, and he asked us, uh, he, he let us pre-prepare uh, a question, which sort of uh, I think was in his question was, and and you know you're you're free to put whatever answers you want. Can farming work for nature and community climate adaption if it is still dominated by global corporates and global food chains? Um, now we maybe both could have a go at answering that, but I'll let you have a stab first, Will. <laughs> Thank you, Nigel. Um, yeah, it's a big question. Um, you know, as, as individual farmers, we can't do much about um, the food chain and, and sort of corporate organisations and the influence that supermarkets have. You know, we can't we can't change that and we have to work to, to, to the parameters in the system we're set in. Um, I think it's interesting how over the last 18 months, you know, there has been much more focus on local food and we've seen sort of online farm shops and things that have actually boomed and that's great and I hope that continues afterwards. Um, I think in terms of sort of nature and the environment and climate, something I've been massively focused on over the last year or two, um, I think it's probably, and, and, and I, well, I say that, I have been, but I never used to be. Uh, you know, I grew up sort of my dad very much sort of 1970s production, push, push, push kind of farm, and I was brought up like that. Um, and then I went to to university, went to Robert Adams, and we, you know, that's pretty much what it was. You know, produce as yeah. much food as you can as efficiently as possible. So I grew up in that way. Um, but over the last sort of several years, I guess I've got much more focused on on what we can do as farmers to help um, in climate change. I think having children has focused my mind a lot, really, yeah. having young children and you think about what what the earth will be like when they grow up and when they start to have children. And I'd hate for them to sort of look back and say, you know, dad, why didn't you do more on the farm? You know, why didn't you, you know, because I think there is a danger with farming. You know, we there's been a lot of talk over the last few years about farmers can be part of the solution. And I think that's true, but it's no good if that's just a slogan, if that's just words, you know, we've got to all try, I think, to varying degrees, you know, we can't all do it, you know, we're obviously, everybody's busy and, you know, first and foremost, you've got to make a profit to, to yeah. run a business. But I think we've got to all try our best on our farms to try and, you know, whether that be planting, even if it's just planting a few trees in a, in a few field corners or planting hedges or letting those hedges get a bit bigger or whatever it may be. You know, we are in the midst of a nature crisis in this country. Um, you know, we're, you know, being directly affected with flooding. I mean, yeah, the last two, yeah. years, last two years, we've had the kind of floods that we used to say happened every 20 years. Um, we've had them the last two years and the amount of damage they do, it, you know, it's cost us a fortune, um, which I guess sharpens the mind, you know. Yes. <laughs> and, you know, so you do start thinking, well, well, if this isn't going to change and there's no signs it will, and it's, well, it's only going to go in one way if these things are going to get worse, then we've got to look at, I guess, what we can do as individual farmers to try and help. So in terms of global food systems, there's not much I can do about that as an individual farmer, but I am very focused at the moment at what, what I can do as an individual farmer on my farm and we've planted a lot of trees and a lot of new hedges in the last year or two and we've got more planned for this winter actually with Nigel Pugh of Welsh Woodland Trust who I've worked with and um, on that so shout out to Nigel because you know which to be fair is, is a good point you know as farmers if we can if those kind of organizations and, and could Coid Caddy the Welsh Woodland Trust have been fantastic with this at reaching out to farmers and sort of talking to us and then what can we do to help you you know that's so powerful and so encouraging um and people like nigel are fantastic at that so you know the more we can sort of work together with organizations the more then we can do on our own farms and um you know they've they've sort of helped helped us out with we had a grant towards planting a huge 
stretch of new hedge which i probably you know realistically without the grant i probably wouldn't have been able to do it so yeah you know it just shows that you know if we can work with these organization organizations you know what we can do so so yes yeah, so i have no answer to uh global corporates dominating the food chain but um you know i do think as individual farmers we can we can make a difference and if we all do it then it adds up to something pretty big i think Oh yeah, I, I think that's a brilliant answer, and and I don't think, you know, I, I totally agree. We were, you know, I was taught at a very early age to focus on what you can control and influence yourself, and yeah. and you or I or, or 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 farmers individually, or even if you get together, can't really alter global food chains and global food supplies. But what you can do is in your own, on your own farm, uh, and I think I th I have a little bit of a a gripe with certain sectors of the media that the, the throw the mud at UK agriculture and don't understand an awful lot of good things that have happened. You said it, you know, if you compare um, what a farmer is doing now to 30, 40 years ago, it's, to it's totally different environmental level. Yeah. Um, and is, I think there's, um, there's more yeah. can be done, but it has to be done on a farm level. And, you know, but I think that's the bit that frustrates me most is just how far farming's farming's come um i think we'll have to go further but it has to be profitable everyone's in you know everyone has to make a living don't they and that's that's yeah. that's what a profit is um and you have to make a living so you you can't just do it for charity uh, mm. it it has to be but i think um great strides have been made and further can be but it it'll be down on a farm or farmer or maybe or or um, local area level, a little, you know, global food chains will do what they're. Yeah, what yeah. I, I I drove down to, you know, like everybody, I've, I've barely been off the farm for the last sort of eighteen months, and then during the May May bank holiday weekend, I went to see um, one of my best friends' farms down in Dorset near Dorchester. So packed packed the kids up in the car, and we drove yeah. down there, and because it was a bank holiday weekend, the M5 was carnage. So. Um, we pretty we pretty much went cross country all the way, um, which is although slower, it just and I guess it's the time of year May June you know the British countryside just looks amazing. But yeah, I'm so glad we went cross country because the countryside just looked incredible, and it just yeah. you know sometimes I think as far you're so busy you don't. You know, you, and you live in the. We, you know, we all live in the countryside. Yeah. You perhaps don't notice it, but it just sort of getting and um, you know, some roads that have never been down before and things. It was just just it takes your breath away sometimes, and it just does. You know, you mentioned the media and, and some of the sort of criticism we get, and I I'm not, you know, I'm not um, one-eyed about farming. I, you know, no. I think we can do things better, and you know, I think and I think it's good in some ways that we're we're held to account by people but at the same time i think some of it goes way too far and just when we drove down there I just said to my wife a few times just god just look at it you know look at this countryside it's just incredible so you know I, i'm very very proud of british farmers and very very proud of the industry yeah. and the work we do in that regard and you know i think um sometimes we we don't quite get the credit we deserve i think yeah, totally, absolutely. I echo those views, and I think those are fantastic views. So we're, we're getting nearer the end, but I've I've got a couple of questions pinged up on on my on my a screen here. So um, uh, the first one uh, is back to the rock and roll farming podcast, and 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 uh, it's it must it's coming from you know if you uh, is the one thing you've learnt from the farming podcast that's that you use on your own farm or is stuck in your head. Um. I think it's, I think to be honest, it's probably um, going back to some of the episodes we've done on mental health, where people have gone through some real challenges um, and come out the other side. And I suppose, you know, I've had my own challenges with this and, and I think it's trying to not be so hard on yourself. Um, you know, I went through a bit of a time where I was sort of, I don't know, I felt, I felt like I was 
I wasn't doing anything well enough. So I, I felt mm -hmm. like I wasn't being a good enough farmer. And then when I was busy on the farm, I wasn't seeing my, the kids. And then and it, uh, my wife was having to look after poor Ken. And then I wasn't being a good enough husband, wasn't. And I felt, you know, I, I, I suppose we're all our own worst critics, but it, it just yeah. got a bit much. And I, I, I try not to do that now. And I think that's probably down to the influence of some of the guests I've spoken to on the podcast. Um, wow. You can't be, you can't, sometimes you have to take a step back, take a breath, focus on what you are good at. I mean, I, I'm not, you know, I'm by no means, I, I make so many, I'm not, I'm a very average farmer. I'm trying to be better, but I, I am. Um, and I, God, I make, I make so many mistakes, but I do try at the same time not to be too hard on myself and focus on what I am good at. And I try and find time. I, I think I've got much better at trying to put time aside for my kids and things like that. And I think that's probably due to some of those conversations we've had on the podcast. So some of those people, you know, and, and, and you know, they, they, they know who they are and, and, um, it, you know, I've, I've, I've talked about this before and people who listen to the podcast will know some of those kind of powerful conversations and, you know, I, yeah, they, they've, they've helped me no end. I think sometimes just finding, finding a better perspective. That, that's, that's a brilliant and brutally honest answer. And, uh, and uh, I felt, yeah, I res loads of respect for you, for you doing that. And I, I, I sympathize with that answer. Uh, yeah, and, and I've, um, you know, been there and done, got that t-shirt where you can just, uh, you need to take, you do mm -hmm. need somebody to almost persuade or tell you to take a step back or whatever, yeah. because you, you mm -hmm. can do it. Uh, so that, that's brutally honest. Thank you for that. The, the next one, um, mustn't think you're quite busy enough um so it, it, it's just put what what what's in the next what's the next challenge or adventure in your um in your sort of uh passion for support in uk agriculture is is there a next chapter or is it, or um, is it just stick with what you're doing at the moment <laughs> um well i suppose i suppose i'm um in january i started a three-year term as a, as a director of the oxford farming conference um you did which I'm hugely passionate about and very focused on. So I guess it's that at the moment. Um, I love the conference, went for the first time in 2018 and just loved it. I think it's a real force for good in British farming. Mm -hmm. Loved it from the moment I arrived in the sort of Oxford University buildings and the kind of history of it all. And um, the history of the conference is amazing, but also it's much more than that it's also incredibly forward thinking and it's something i'm really proud to be part of i think we've got a brilliant team of directors um we've got a, a great theme for next year's conference where we're going to be really focused in on on the that kind of squeezed middle of british farming um yeah. and, the, and the title of the conference is roots to resilience um uh, great team great team of directors um brilliant um joint chairman or chairperson in um sarah Mukherjee and barbara bray mm -hmm. so uh yeah i i guess I, I guess that's that's the next thing I, i'm i'm sort of very involved in that and i love i love being part of it and uh, i think i'm really really looking forward to the next three years as a director so yeah i i guess yeah a long rambly answer to a short question right. but yeah that's, that's the next not, challenge not a rambly answer at all and you can clearly see by just seeing your expression and, and your positiveness that you, you're passionate about it and I, again i think you and i would both agree that it's all about learning it's providing yeah. challenge you know challenge your thoughts you know don't they might not all uh, um be relevant to your own business they might not all fit your own business but just go on open-minded and say well that doesn't work for me but others uh um may well be and i think it's about that on mine so put it um I've, there's there's another message come through here and uh I'll, I'll it, it's more of a comment which which i share entirely so uh some very pertinent points will young kids older parents busy business building for later years our 30s and 40s are a real challenge credit to you for your openness uh your presentation to the future farmers of yorkshire about yorkshire which i remember well is still talked about you're more of an inspiration than you realise. Thank you. So, <laughs> I, I, you know, I can't sum it up uh, better than that. And that's probably um, so. Just before I, I thank Will for it, for it, for his participation tonight, um, 
this is the last one of our audience with webinars until October. We're going to take a summer break so we can all enjoy our staycations. Uh, this year, I think it'll have to be. Uh, but mine will yeah. mine will be spent on the farm as usual. Um, we are, as ever, we'll be releasing this uh, as a, a recording afterwards, uh, and also. Um, We'll be releasing in audio version all the previous six we've done if people there want to listen to them in cars. But uh, Will, um, thank you so much for your participation. I've thoroughly enjoyed that chat um, and your open and honestness. Uh, we'll keep we'll keep in touch. I'm sure we'll all uh, keep following you on the Rock and Roll Farming podcast and Twitter and things. And and thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for having me, Andrew. It's been um, it's been fun fun answering questions instead of asking them for a time. Ah, good. We 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 do determined to get you on the on the other side of the <laughs> microphone, and you've done brilliant. Cheers, Will. Cheers, Andrew.